Right, what we're going to do today is really look forward a couple of weeks to a fortnight from today when all of your posters will be completed and we'll come in here and post them up all around the wall. The, uh, wall. We'll have this marking sheet here, uh, lots and lots and lots and lots of copies of it so that you can go and mark at least five other people's posters, not your own. Um, you'll have your, put the number of the, post, uh, the student poster there, so that means you need to put your student number at the bottom of your poster so we can actually mark it and associate the marks with you. But because you're going to be doing the majority of the work, it's called peer assessment, and it works at level six in this final year because you all know how the marking schemes work in principle and what we're looking for, the really great work. But because you are going to be doing the work, um, here are the criteria. Well, it will be there by the end of this session. And to make it easy, there are just four different scores. Either, oops, I really don't think this achieves anything at all under that criterion. Or, okay, it's not too bad. <coughs> or, okay, it's pretty good, pretty decent. Um, or, wow, it really grabs me. And what we're going to do today is to come up with six or seven or even eight criteria which you will, by the end of today, feel comfortable using. Comfortable that your own poster will get assessed appropriately by those who around here, your co colleagues here, and also by people like myself and Mosin, uh, perhaps Dave Vohis, uh, and probably Virginia and Asma, and one or two other colleagues who will come up here. And we'll, uh, uh, lecturers, evaluate these independently of what you guys are doing. We'll also be keeping an eye open for uh, those of you who collect your, get, collect five of your friends together and you all mark each other's in there for no good reason other than <laughs> they're my friends. Now, let me just share a little story about the same sort of peer assessment which is used in business um, in terms of something called, it's called 360 degree review and this started in the mid 1990s as a way of getting independent advice for, or input from your colleagues about how you relate in your business, in the business world to your colleagues and you've got six pieces of paper and, you were, and six envelopes and you had to give them to six people and there had to be someone who was at your level, one a peer Someone who was a customer of yours, I, your work went to them. Uh, someone to whom, maybe not necessarily you reported, but someone senior to you, and someone junior to you, and so you end up with six people. And we use it here as well a little bit. Now, in the original form of that, it was designed that you did this, they put their assessment of you into the envelope and sent it off to some external agency who would collect up the marks, put them together and send you back a private assessment. And you could use that to your manager and say, this suggests that I need some assistance and training or a course in something like whatever it might have been, interpersonal skills or um, whatever. <clears throat> now, this is how it was actually implemented in its original form. What was interesting was that we chose the six people we would give our forms to very, very Carefully. There was no implication on our salary, there was no requirement that our manager would ever get to see the results to find out how we actually fitted in, but even so, we chose our the people who were going to fill this in for us, the people we trusted to give a reasonably fair um, input on us. Now it meant that we didn't be just poor all the ticks into the far right hand corner, excellent, outstanding, fantastic and brilliant. We would actually put it in there. We tended not to choose people who we knew were going to give us in the left hand side. The HR theoreticians 
had created the tool in that sense, advice to me that no one else needed to know. A little while later, the HR consultancies started selling this as a tool for uh, people of the management to use the results to actually evaluate their the staff performance and then performance bonuses were attached to that. Now at that stage, what happens is you choose your people carefully and you all ensure that they all come in the far right hand column, which then gives HR and the management a problem because everybody is overachieving. So, the lesson from that is not to choose people who are going to mark really highly, because you don't learn anything at all. So and what we're trying to do with this is to do two things for you. It's the sort of stuff that's going to happen in the future, next year, when you're out there in the big wide world, because your team are going to be around you and they are going to be doing some sort of assessment of you. If you do it correctly, you will learn about yourself. And it's incredibly important to learn about yourself and how you fit into the team that you're working in and the company you're working in. It can help you to identify things you need to do better or things that you're unhappy about. And maybe you choose a new job somewhere else because you're not fe feeling or you're finding you're not fitting in. You probably knew that already. But this is a very, very practical use of peer assessment. It's only worth about 30%, I think it was, of the assessment here. Most of you, historically, from previous uh, modules when we've run this, the actual quality of your uh, infographic posters is actually really going to be very high. Almost all of you are going to score in these yes. two. You have to work quite hard, actually, to get yourself into these off the end. Quite deliberately. I think they're helpful. But to make it work, we've got to come up with a set of criteria, which I'll type in here over the, with, on the keyboard, and then we'll sort of kind of debate some of the aspects. And when we do the moderation, and again, going back to previous years, we find, generally speaking, that my colleagues, the academics, pretty much confirm what you guys have done, if you're doing it honestly. Now, if you're just cheating and giving your friends that, then there will be some fairly vigorous downgrading if it's not of an appropriate quality. What I will do is please also ensure that when you actually do do the marking in a fortnight's time, not only do you tick in the right boxes here, but you also add them up to and put them in that column, in that square there. Because that makes my life a little bit easier, because I'm going to put anything from, depending how many pieces of paper there are under each of the posters, could be from five up to, sometimes people do it, get ten pieces of input. I put that number for, from each piece of paper against that student number. And then the spreadsheet that sort of averages it. If there are some, now every, most people have agreed on somewhere around the, that was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eighty there. Most people are scoring a post at 80, and then there are two at 120. That's going to mean, hmm, I wonder, I'll have to have a look at it myself and see whether that really is relevant, whether it was that these people actually really did get it better than the rest of the people. They just didn't engage, didn't attract their attention, didn't convince them that it was a wow factor. But if I find in this, or most of them I find in the good, not the wow, that's part of the moderation that ensures that you get the right grade. Alternatively, you know, sometimes you get up two or three down here and all the rest are up here. And then I start thinking, now is that real that the poster didn't communicate to two or three people properly in some way or other? Or was it just they were feeling grumpy? At which point the outliers get deleted and your average moves up to what I consider more fairly reflexive. So you are doing it to get a practice at it I'm then moderating it to make sure that every single one of you gets the ultimate number there that actually reflects what you've got. So you are protected, um, particularly from unreasonably low marks, but also I protect the quality of what you're all doing by making sure 
that it is not overmarked or overscored too high. So you will get at the end of the process and we'll get the results out to you within about a week or so. Um, and what we'll do, we'll post them into Turnitin so I can then put the mark and any feedback so that you can get at it quickly. Does that feel reasonable, folks? You're happy with that to start with? It's an overall approach. Over the three years that we've been doing this, I've been doing this one like this, um, the comfort levels has, has, has grown because we've been able to explain what's happened, what we're doing to prevent things going wrong, um, and a whole range of things that have helped to improve the levels of comfort. Because three years ago, there was a small group of people who, for other reasons than what was actually going on in class, um, had carried some historical baggage with them, and they were pretty uncomfortable at the time. And so we've tried to address all of those to make sure that this process works as fairly as possible for you, but it also gives you this um, new skill to be able to peer assess in a fair and helpful fashion. And there's also a box down here where I would like you to provide positive feedback about the things that really went well about that poster in your perception as you looked at it, you thought about it, and yes, this is one, one or two of the things that really stood out to me that made it a great poster or a good poster. I'll put in anything myself about the things that are not so good. So again, you're contributing positives in your assessment of your colleagues, not the negatives. I'll do the negatives, you do the positives. So, having said all that, thinking about those infographics posters that you've already researched and looked at over the last week or two in the workshops, what sort of factors do you think we need to put in to be able to assess the quality of an infographic poster and thinking of it in terms of a kind of pictorial abstract what you are intending to write about. Not necessarily what you will write about, but what you're intending to write about. So that you can grab the attention from your infographic poster of the people who you want to read your article. What are eight, we've got up to eight points here that we can uh, capture that you feel is important in working out whether that infographic poster really works as a pictorial abstract. And remember, the purpose of an abstract is to grab a potential reader's attention to, and persuade them that it is worth them investing some time in reading 3,000 words of an article. OK. What sort of factors do you think we need to have there about this infographic poster? You don't want it to be too wordy. Well, not too wordy, we'll, we can refine the words, and what we'll do, we'll capture the, some ideas quickly, and then we'll refine the topics, the wording, so that it means something to you in a fortnight's time when you're assessing people, but also means something to you over the next couple of weeks while you refine your research that leads to the stunning infographic poster. A novel topic. Okay. One. Design, like eye catches, it's got everything. <laughs> <laughs> yep. G. I'm going to just put these down for the moment, then we can discuss them. Sources. It's got to be concise and to the point. If it is like obviously infographic, you don't want to have a clarity. 
So she always put. Now, as remember, it's an infographic, so it's got what's it going to have with it? The main thing that, could, that you build infographic posters on. Statistics. Yep. Now remember I said this is a pictorial abstract. So what, would, and what did I say was the purpose of a pictorial abstract? It summarizes the topic pretty well. Yeah, that's one. So it summarizes a topic. What else does it have to do? It's a pictorial abstract. And the purpose of an abstract was to do what? To grab your attention. To grab your attention. So it's got to be persuasive. Yeah? Yep. And it makes you want to go away and research more into the topic. Now, if you think about the range of topics that you guys are covering, are you expecting everybody to want to go and read the article? Or are you, go back to last week or the week before when we were talking about how to design a presentation, how to design a poster. Are you writing for everybody or what was the question? Is, the pop, is, are your, is your target audience kind of narrow, or is it everybody? Wasn't it? Remember that one? Mm -hmm. So do we need one more potential criterion before we start culling them or merging them or something? Is there another topic that we ought to have relating to, say, the clarity of your target population, of your audience? Nodding sagely. <clears throat> okay, so we've now got Okay, now, first of all, do you think that having eleven criteria is something you can cope with easily? Too much work. Too much that's a good idea, it's too much work. Absolutely. Yep. Because think of adding up. 11 boxes. Not that some difficult, but... Yeah. No, so, let's just save that so we've got a starter for, for 10. Oops. Okay, now, let's start. What we'll do in this column, we'll kind of give a, a rating from 1 to 11 of the importance. But which of those 11 proposed items is, do you guys feel is probably the most mm. important? Because we're going to keep probably 8 out of the 11 or maybe merge the remaining 3 into some of the other topics. So, which is the most important? Do you think if this is a pictorial, graphical, statistics-based um, abstract that grabs someone's attention. Eye-catching design. Eye-catching design is number one. Do you ever, does everybody agree with that, or is that just a one-off? Because this has to be consensus. So there's a proposal that... Yeah. <laughs> Eye-catching design is number one. Okay. Yep. 
Now, what's the next one going to be? Let's make these centered and bold and something we can see. Where's the centered one? <laughs> So it's got to be eye-catching in design. That's what you all agree is the most important. Mm. Okay. So the topic next. To you think the novel's your attention? It's got to be a topic which is obviously interesting and quite near and fresh. Okay. It's going to be a simple one. Well, are okay. we happy with that one? Would be a second. Is that really yeah. consensus? Yes. Yes. Okay. Mm. Right. <laughs> so the next, one, what's going to be the most next most important one? The statistics. You think statistics. Everybody believes that having clear statistics is is the third one. Say quality of sources. Giant third. Well, you could probably combine quality of sources. And yeah, it's quality. Quality of sources and statistics. statistics. Yeah, basically the same thing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Bearing in mind, of course, that there aren't going to be, going to be very few, if any, citations or references on here. A few citations occasionally, but not many. How many facts are you going to fit on an A4 sheet of paper in like reality, like six? Have a look and see. You know, have a look at all those um, infographic posters you've been looking at and see whether, what happens if you put them onto A4. Are you on the screen with? Something can't read them. <laughs> that has another implication. That's part of clarity, probably somewhere. I assume you actually have an actual abstract within this infographic Say it on again slowly. <laughs> I, I assume we wouldn't be having an actual textual abstract within this. Post. Oh, no, no, no. This is a visual abstract. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. I mean, one of the key things here is, is reduce the amount of text. Yeah. Because otherwise you're not going to be able to read it. Exactly. That's what I was, that's what I was concerned So about. if you see, I mean, you can see up on Google. Yeah. Uh, if you go for infographic posted images, you'll see some which, which work a treat yeah. and some which are fairly catastrophic. I mean, if you look at those, post, those um, <coughs> poster presentation, uh, A2 or A1 posters that you see around the university that go up in conferences, poster presentations, the ones that work are the ones which don't have too much text. The ones which are difficult are ones which are all text, mm -hmm. and in A2, that's the size it's 12 point text. A is not going to work on A4, that amount of text, but B, even on A, A2, at a, a conference poster presentation, it's really quite tedious, isn't it, most of them? Those are the ones we don't go and look at. So we're mer merging statistics into, which one was it, remind me? Oh, sources. Yeah. Do we want quality of sources or just statistics and quality or quality of statistics? Quality of quality of statistics. Let's go for something simple, it's always easier. So we've just got deleted that one. Okay, so we now say quality of statistics is number three. Three, I think. I'm just curious about the quality of statistics. What do we mean by quality of statistics? I mean, clear statistics, when you're looking at the actual poster, you, you understand what the statistics is going about. When you see the graphs and stuff, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, anyone would like to add to that? How, how, I mean, the thing really is, here you're getting to that one, uh, you've got somebody's poster there. How are you going to judge between oops, basic, good, or wow? How are you going to do that when you actually look at it? Because these are the criteria that you are going to be using and that you want other people to, you're going to design the best poster you can get and you therefore want people to mark you there. How are you going to get them to judge that? Statistics that actually make sense for what you're talking about, it's not, say, on one thing, and as you're reading through it, you're like, well, why is this number actually here? What's its relevance to the topic? So shall we change the wording to statistics make sense? <laughs> yeah. Because they come in too many forms, like some people are going to use graphs, and some people are going to use percentages, and some people are going to use other studies, so it's related to one thing. 
Okay, but these are your criteria, and not mine. These are the ones you guys are going to be using. Okay, so that's number three, statistics that make sense. <coughs> Which is the next one that you think is going to be really important? Well, ultimately, we'll just sequence them in that order for you. So, we're engaging further research, but summarise the topic in the type of audience you expect to see all of them after you've seen the statistics after you've made the topic. I mean, does it matter which order as long as they're near the top? But you, you, do you all agree that of the ones that are remaining, these three, what about that one? These four, maybe, are the most significant ones. How about you persuasive would be next? You want persuasive next. Well, once you've got your eye topic, uh, you want you've got your novel topic, your eye catching design, and the nice statistics. If it's an abstract, the whole point of it's supposed to be persuasive, isn't it? To get you interested in the topic. Yeah. So that's to sway your opinion. Right. That's what I would say. I wouldn't say for them. Okay. Mm, surely, if it's persuasive, it, it will encourage further research. You'll yeah. look at it and think, I want to read thing. that article, I want to know a bit more about this. So, almost we could remove this one and merge it with persuasive and encourages. as you go and look at a random poster up there. Present the data effectively. Pardon? Present the data effectively. Well, no, what I mean was, you're, that one is kind of that, the statistics that make sense. Yeah, but, but you move on to the next criteria. In terms of persuasiveness, then. It's presented very poorly. You're not going to convince anyone, really. Um, right. For being persuasive, you're giving yourself your personal view and your opinion on the topic. Probably when there's going to be a lot in the area, a lot of different directions, so you're trying to get people on board with one thing you're trying to discuss, which you're showing in the stats and whatnot. Yep. Which leads us, in a sense, I think, back to that one. I don't agree with that one. What? Novelty no, topic. topic. Because, like, um, like, one person may um, seem interesting to one person, but like a different person may um, have like different interests. It's more to do with the fact that it's like a recent topic, really, in terms of being novel. Right. Now we're coming to this one. Who is the audience? And it also encourages you, in a sense, as we're doing this, to step back from your own personal narrow interests and begin to be able to think, okay, yes, there's a clear audience for that one, and it, and it obviously is this sort of audience, which is not necessarily me, but having done that, can I put myself into the, feet, the sort of feet of, um, or into the shoes of someone who has that interest to then decide these other factors? Because you've actually got to step outside yourselves a bit as you assess everybody else, because the, you know, the CFI people are going to have You've, because of your background, you've got an understanding of novelty in the forensic investigation area, which the IT students probably don't have to the same extent. But you're going to be, hopefully, marking some of theirs, and they're going to mark some of yours. So you've got to be able to learn to step outside your own particular narrow interests and assess somebody else's. So. That's going to include things like clarity of the target audience, who may not be me normally, but in this case, I can see who it's meant to be. And for that sort of a person, then, it'll be novel, it'll be eye-catching, and so on. Do you understand what I'm getting at? You see, this is what we, most and I have to do, and many of the um, academics in general. We may have uh, specific domain areas that we're really, really interested in, that we're doing lots of research in, for me, analytics, governance, um, 
vacation services specifically this year, last year. But I have to step out of, outside of that a lot of the time when I'm assessing you guys. For example, the CFI, because you've got all sorts of other experience, and I'm learning from it, that most is learning from you, and we jointly are learning a lot about each other, about each other's ideas, learning all the time. And when you go out into the big wide world, your jobs, you are going to succeed better in your jobs if you can actually demonstrate or develop this broader um, perspectives around your subject area and elsewhere, whether it's by reading, whether it's by keeping up with the news, and so on. So how are, how are we going to connect that and that? Because I think that was George's question about novelty. How do they understand the novelty of that sort? How are you going to demonstrate the novelty? Do we just have to look at it and say, oh gosh, that's novel, or it tells me it's unusual? So that's going to be the other aspect that drives how you design your infographic posters. How are we going to recognise novelty? Alternatively, how are you, when you design your posters, show why it is novel? Possibly by presenting an interesting dilemma that the, that the topic yeah. covers. This, sure. this happens in this field and this is why it's interesting. Yeah, so we may be saying novel topic. Um, <laughs> so what we've done here is rather than saying it's novel because we want it to be novel, but great. But as a generalized reader, I need to have you demonstrate why it's novel. <coughs> kind of goes back to the specification. Identifying something the reader doesn't know that they don't know, but which is important. <coughs> okay. Richard. Yeah, I'd like to make a comment here. When, when you are evaluating, and we go through this every day, uh, evaluating somebody else's work, you know, paper or, or uh, research, if you come up with your own opinion, you need to be able to defend it. So if you decided that you're going to give me good for whatever topic, I, as an author, might disagree with you. So part of the editing process is the, uh, the author would have the right to write back to the editor to say, well, this is, you know, I disagree with you and this is what I meant or this is what you should consider. So in that respect, I think once you give a mark, then you should be able to stand by that. So it is very important that you have an opinion, which is good, but also have a reason to give that opinion that you would be able to share with people. And again, you see, that's why these numbers are chosen. That's sort of, obviously, nothing of merit. That's a pass. It's equivalent to 42%. Uh, that is equivalent of sort of 65, 70% and that's 100. So, and we're giving you only four marks because it's easy, ultimately, or should be easy for each of you to defend your mark on that sort of level. If we asked you to just say, okay, from a scale of 0 to 10, put a mark there, or from 0 to 100, put a mark in there, you're never going to justify the difference in 62 and 65%. It's impossible, completely impossible to justify why I'd give one person 62% and one 65% or 63 But you've got four. Total failure, pass, effectively 2 1, first. It's a categorical classification. Yeah. Rather than numerical classification. Yeah, that's right. <clears throat> so let's go back to that. Now we've got demonstrates novelty of topic, which I think everybody's now comfortable with, are we? We've got eye-catching design, because that's about what posters are all about, grabbing your attention, grabbing your eyes. Mm -hmm. We've got one that looks at the um, statistics that, yeah, they all fit together, they make sense together. Mm -hmm. We've got this persuasive and encourages further research. So even if it's not my topic area, 
wow, I think I'm going to have to start reading about it, or I'm going to read the article when it comes out. What's the next one that we need to start thinking about? And how are we going to assess it? We've got two, four, six, eight. We've still got nine there. We've still got to get rid of at least one or merge it with something else. Think of the target audience. Target audience, so we'll have that as number five for the moment. Right, how are you going to, from that poster, how are you going to determine whether the target audience is clear? Wording. Wording. Right, that's one thought. I would say it depends on the context <coughs> you, put, you present the problem in. For example, if you're presenting a problem in the business that is related to management, maybe. So it's clear that's that you're... That's so your problem is, you know, anyone can read about it, but you're hoping that people in middle management would read it, for example, and become aware of an issue. Okay, so how do we put that, merge that in with one of the existing criteria that was there? The target audience should be clear after you've got a summary of the topic. So we've got summarise the topic and clear target audience. Do we put those two together now, or are they still separate topics, do you think? By the time you've read, the, obviously, the abstract and the whole paper, you can have a clear idea if it's obviously the novelty, the whole topic, and um, overall... We're talking now, target. and you're now talking about the written abstract that comes in a few weeks' yeah. time. So how do we capture that in an infographic poster? Do we have to have a little block of words that helps us with that, do you think? Exactly. Well, go back to, again to those infographic posters that you've already looked at. What was it that helped you to understand what it was about? Was it just the, the graphics, the, the statistics and the graphics and the charts and the pictures and so on? Or was there something else about each a really good infographic poster that helped you to work out some of these factors? Right, in fact, one way we could do that is to actually start thinking about applying those to the infographic posters we've already looked at. How many of you looked at a, a range of good posters now? And do you see how these are beginning to apply to each of those ones that you've looked at? Yeah. So if we start thinking now about the audience and the summarisation of the topic, are they two separate items? Is that part of that? Where is it leading you about those two criteria? I would say that summarising the topic could be rolled into demonstrating novelty. And by demonstrating novelty, you probably are summarising it. So, do you think so if we put in up here, demonstrates and summarises, Take that one out now. Okay, so we're now getting to sort of a sensible number of criteria. Um, so we've got clear target audience. Does that include things like the title and maybe a small block of text? Is that what you see in all the successful? posters you've already assessed. Okay. So now we're left with those two there, spe spelling, grammar, uh, simplicity, and concise to the point and clarity. Which of those do we fundamentally need? Can we ditch any of those three? Can we merge any one of those with uh, another point? We can merge simplicity with clarity. I feel like they're both contained. Sorry. Or simplicity with design. Or, 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 or,
So you're talking about the simplicity of the actual topic, or, this, or the design, or the writing, or We're the simplicity is too broad. Okay, so do we think that's a misleading criterion, and we really rely on the conciseness of the point and the clarity there? Okay. What we're actually doing, for those who are interested, is a little bit, something that we, you'll find will happen occasionally in business, is we're actually do, using a brainstorming type of approach to say. And one of the things you notice, I didn't challenge any of those ideas at the beginning. It's really, really important when you're using a brainstorming session, you capture all of the ideas immediately. And then you go back into this reviewing and considering and developing and enhancing the ideas. And I, I first came across this at Rolls-Royce back in the sort of early mid-80s. And it was really quite useful to learn this brainstorming technique. And there are various ways it's done. Um, this is a, kind of works quite nicely here. So now we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven criteria. And so we've got that. So now proofreading. How important is that going to be? But do you think we still have it here? We do. I mean, if you think about the criteria for the article marking, proofreading is an important point. And you know, you've got proper, all the proper sort of use of bold and italics and what have you. Do we think that proofreading ought to stay in there as a I mean, point? It's, it's mostly graphical. We will have a a bit of wording, but it's not going to be the major focus of the poster. Okay. Is there something that we could add in to do with you know, choice of colours, choice of graphics, perhaps? We've got an eye-catching design, yes. We've got statistics that make sense. But have we included that important point about the way that the data is actually presented. You know, if, you, if you remember, certainly those guys do, and we, you, we'll, I'll post up the link for you. There's a very interesting presentation, a TED presentation, um, that some of us looked at last semester, about choice of graphical presentation. And the particular person who was giving it, who was an ex-Google uh, expert, said very, very bluntly, that most, on most occasions, pie charts are completely useless. They just happen to be terribly easy to generate in Excel. So is there something that kind of relates to this spelling and grammar, proofreading about the text, that also could be applied to the choice of graphical presentation, this choice of types of charts? Could we do something about around that one there? Is that useful? And again, thinking about all of those infographic posters you've looked at so far, how important to you was having the data presented appropriately in vertical bar charts or whatever? How important was that actually? This is yours, remember. Do you want to add that one in? Do you want to have something along, that, along those lines? Um, like I know it's a bit like off topic, but you could put spelling and grammar with um, H at CI, like I did them. Um, it's, so for, for, for an example, did you want have like small writing or like um, like um, mix black and white together and stuff like that? So I would actually have H at CI. Right, to make sure that people can uh, read it. Okay, yes. Yeah. So it's, one is eye-catching design, and the other one that you're just sort of kind of talking about is the overall design, the way the various elements fit together, the appropriate mix of text and, and graphs and charts and images and what have you. Is that really what you're getting at? Yeah. Does that feel kind of a, a helpful way of doing it? Okay, so we've got eye-catching design, and then we replace that one by...
appropriate design if we can capture it as that. Is that the right words you'd like to see there, or is there a better thought wording that you'd like to see there? Presentation and layout. Okay. Definitely the, the layout will be, obviously, like the text, it really is, that's more than it's the design. It's just, when I think of design, I think of colour and imagery. Yeah. <laughs> Let's leave it like that. We'll leave that at number six for the moment. I'll sort it out. We're running out of time now. So, does that look as though you could use that to effectively? And we, if you like, we can actually try that out. I'll post it up when we get downstairs, and then you can actually try it out on one or two um, of those infographic posters you've got already there, and then start thinking about the consequences of those on your design of your poster. Is that going to work guys? Yeah. Okay, lovely. Well, let's close there.